solutions. So that is first to say that African solutions are not one solution, nor are they harmonious, that they clearly are differences in point of view uh, to African solutions. Now, that's important to realize because something about this phrase uh, is, says, stay off, stay away, right? It's, it's African solutions for African problems. There's something about the phrase that suggests there's some other people somewhere who believe they have solutions for African problems. And the people saying African solutions for African problems are sort of a bit of doorkeepers, right? And, and that, I don't think it's true, but can easily, because I think some people do see it that way, can easily lead to um, a sense of one solution and that one solution by one African of sufficient power then becomes the African solution to that particular African problem. That's not, I don't think that should be the case. I don't think that's what this famous phrase means. I think it means ownership by African people about African problems. Is there something uniquely, is there something like an African problem? Uh, genocide is not an African problem. It's a, it's a human problem. Uh, and poverty is not an African problem. War is not an African problem. These are part of the human condition. No, more into this in just a second. Now, take for example, the phrase African solution for African problem has caused a lot of experts to doubt how to approach this particular concept onto how they are progressing within the region. If you look, for example, the small African country of Djibouti, it's just so strategic with regards to its location. Djibouti and its location is a strategic shipping lane where you find over annually some over 20,000 ships and 30% of world trade pass through this particular location. In addition, Djibouti is found and also pressed between two highly conflicted regions, notably the Horn of Africa and the Gulf region, where from a security point of view, has its global strategic importance. Nevertheless, this strategic location and importance that it draws is also not only positive, there are also some negative aspects with regards to this location. Imagine that there is a civil war in Djibouti, God forbid, do you think the Chinese, the United States, the Americans, or the French or the Japanese, the Chinese base is located by the Chinese operated port of the Darale to the west of Djibouti city? To the south of the city are several other foreign military bases that include Camp Lemonier, run by the United States Navy. Do you also have Bas Arien? 188, which is the French air base, and you have the Japanese self-defense forces based in Djibouti. You have other local and other very international countries that are focused in this region. If a civil war actually broke out there, do you believe that these countries will allow the Djibouti government to take control of things using the phrase African solutions to African problem? As we all know that there are a number of things that are not just African solutions that should be applied onto it. Poverty is not an African problem. War is not an African problem. Economic downturn is not an African problem. The, calling it African solutions also puts a geography to this solution. It says it's not a Kenyan solution to African problems or Kenyan solution to Kenyan problems, even though clearly we do have Kenyan solutions to Kenyan problems, that we have a whole government dedicated to solving those problems. Uh, it, it, it says that there's something unique about the need for a united approach, an African unity in pursuit of solutions. But why would you need a united response? Is there, are these problems united? Are African problems all being experienced in the same way uh, at the same time all over Africa? Of course not, but it recognizes. So I think African solutions is an act of claiming these problems that we are, we are suffering from and saying we need to come together to solve them together because the global environment in which we exist makes it particularly important that we should unite because without doing so, 
the global dynamics will not allow us each where we are to solve the problems that we're under. So there's something about African solutions to African problems that is a recognition of the global structure of power and decision making. Now, if I was to just bring that to, um, but before I, I bring it to the Security Council, uh, let me just commend, I was looking at, you know, I was looking at the various articles and essays and papers written about this phrase. And one of the most interesting and most recent I found was uh, a column in South Africa's Daily Maverick from the 22nd of March by Dr. Adeoe Akinola. Adeoe Akinola. That is titled, and I quote it, we must return to the true meaning of African solutions to African problems, but not where African elites are the problem. Now, this is just to bring back, uh, of course, I know when you speak at the Harris School, you're clearly only speaking to the elites. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> just joking. Uh, um, but I am a member of that elite, uh, if only by way of my official role. Uh, and I agree about his strong sentiments about the governance gap, which is what he's bringing up. And I think those of you who are skeptical about this phrase, and I don't meet many people who are skeptical about it because they mostly don't dare tell me about their skepticism, but I know it's there. I know it's there. Uh, and he, he's talking about a governance gap. He's talking about problems we have in different states in Africa, if not all states in Africa. Um, and, and perhaps the hint of occasional self-serving uh, behind this phrase sometimes. Um, and so Dr. Kinola puts his, his finger on an important point. But of course, it's never that easy uh, or that simple. Uh, on, especially when you lay the blame on a sort of amorphous, diverse, and a differently formed groups of uh, governance elites or elites of, you know, in whatever way you, you, you make that. He makes many constructive points. Uh, and one of them is, is the one that will bring me to joining this uh, African solutions to African problems to the work that we do in the Security Council. And that is his observation that good intentions do not necessarily form uh, good solutions. So um, in the Security Council, the Security Council is, to put it simply, a body that is defined by the tension between its legal underpinning and its procedural underpinnings and the political settlement at the end of World War II, right? That's actually why it's unable to solve the problem of Ukraine today. This tension between the letter of the law and the political settlement. That political settlement was made without most Africans at the table. So it means that the political settlement that ended up with the UN Security Council uh, is deeply uninformed by African perspectives. And so we in the Security Council who are from African countries and African and, and the non-permanent membership category was added and three African states uh, were, uh, uh, are always in the Security Council for two-year terms, means that we find a Security Council that spends 60 to 70% of its time or its products dedicated to African crises or African conflicts. If in fact, if there was to be peace tomorrow in Africa and there was no Ukraine crisis, the Security Council would be the sleepiest institution <laughs> in the United Nations. They'd, they'd turn up, debate for an hour a day and then go home. And they wouldn't have that much to discuss. But why don't they have that much to discuss? One is because but some of the security order in different parts of the world has been more stable. But also because Africa and its political inability to leverage its power at the global level means that there's a lot of practicing of good intentions in Africa. There's ways in which Africans are unable to resist the stranger with good intentions, especially who has a lot of money, a lot of weapons, and a lot of interests. So when we're in the Security Council, 
we seek to shape the conversation to be closer to the decisions being made by the African Union uh, and the decisions being made by the Peace and Security Council of the African Union and by the heads of state and government of the African Union. That's not the only, those are not the, they do not have a monopoly on African solutions, but they have a unique monopoly on responsibility to African people. And it does not mean that because a decision is from the Peace and Security Council, it is superior to a solution proposed by a brilliant professor or student at the Harris School. But it does mean it has a greater sense of ownership. And that sense of ownership is really the key to its success. And if it fails, is the key to the adjustment to that failure and the new solution being put on the table. And so when we talk in the Security Council and say, listen to Africa, we're not saying Africa knows better than everybody. We're not saying African policy makers know better than everybody. We're just saying it's our problem and we want to take the lead in solving it. The fact that we should even have to make this argument itself is an indication of the power dynamics in the Security Council. And last year, we had a very famous case, uh, the last year and the year before, where St. Vincent and the Grenadines was a member of the Security Council. And this uh, small island with a with a relatively small population, uh, the smallest country to ever serve in the UN Security Council, came into the council and said, we shall align our position entirely with Africa and with the African Union. I think this was a historical act of people of African descent from the Caribbean, our diaspora, saying that we shall politically get to the most powerful table on the global stage and we shall promote Africa's interests. I think it's a historic, a historic action. And what, were they, what, what did that mean? First, it meant that the African Union's sixth region, we have five regions in Africa, the sixth region is a broad diaspora. But until this act, it had mostly been thought of as individual diaspora members. So those of you who either were born in the United States but of African descent, or those of you who's um, parents are newly arrived or families are newly arrived or you are newly arrived. It was thought of as that's the diaspora. It's like uh, groups of individuals and communities outside Africa. But this single act created an entire, I think, new political understanding of what the sixth region means. It meant then that African solutions are not just for Africans in Africa, it also meant that acts of solidarity uh, and uh, the formation of coalition can produce an African solution to an African problem. So when St. Vincent left the, 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 the Security Council at the end of last year, uh, and we, have, we had one more year to serve, um, a, 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 an interesting um, uh, uh, exchange happened between uh, me and, and my American counterpart, uh, 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 Linda. And uh, Linda said, who's African-American, said, well, you know, I am the plus one. Now, now that St. Vincent has left, I am naturally the plus one. Because I'm African-American, you're African, this is Af Af <laughs> the Africa 3 plus one. And it was meant, uh, she's a brilliant diplomat and a, and a great friend. And, and it really brought us to thinking, what does that plus one mean? In other words, what does the African solution that we bring to the Security Council, how can the other delegations, if at all, join it? And of course, we, we then, in our retreat, we, we said we'll, we'll keep this plus. And what that plus means is that any delegation from the American delegation, the French delegation, the Russian delegation, any delegation that joins with us in promoting the solutions we think are the most relevant can proudly come and join the A3. The, that's what we call the African countries on the, uh, on the Security Council. And so we find ourselves 
um, seeking, when we talk about African solutions, seeking to find what are those parts of the country, the region, the African Union that have, are engaged with the, with the problem and what do they need from the Security Council? Let me give you a few examples of, of that. There's an African mission in Somalia that is fighting Al-Shabaab. There is an African mission in Southern Africa, in Mozambique, that is combating terrorist organizations in Northern Mozambique. Part of the African solutions require uh, a change, um, uh, require a change, a global change. And that is because there are certain economic and political structures globally that are, play a disproportionate role in either causing or escalating problems in Africa. So it so means that part of African solutions are global. In other words, not every problem to be solved in Africa is to be solved in Africa. And there are African problems that need to be solved in Washington, D.C., at the World Bank and the IMF. There are African problems that need to be uh, solved in uh, European agricultural policy. So African solutions are not just limited to problems as they manifest themselves on the ground in Africa.